So good evening to all. Uh, today's session is about effective teaching strategies. As educators, however experienced we are, we are always short of strategies because every year we get a new set of students and it's a very dynamic, uh, you know, relationship which exists between different, different batches. So I want to welcome you all uh, to this session and I'm sure you will have something to take back after the session on how to become a better educator. Uh, we all, of course, there is no end to the ideas and strategies because every year, in spite of our number of years of experience, we keep learning. We also learn from our new recruits, the new young teachers who bring in new ideas. We learn from our seniors, we learn from our peer, and we also learn from sessions like this. And our constant endeavor is to become better teachers. So on that note, I want to welcome all the people who have joined today for this session uh, and uh, want to improve yourself as an educator. So I think the most important thing is that we need to have an objective. Unless we have an objective, we will not be able to achieve it. We need to have a goal. And that is why there is so much emphasis in our school and in the CBSE system to make lesson plans. Because unless we make a plan that, okay, this is what I'm going to do uh, today in the class, then what happens? We are not doing full justice in the class. If we do random things, then after a certain time, you realize that you have not given your best. Uh, perhaps because of your knowledge and experience and expertise, you can deliver a lecture for 40 minutes or one hour. That's not the issue. But when we prepare for the class, okay, today I'm going to do this activity. Tomorrow I'm going to plan out this activity. Then your class is going to become much better. So the objective is very, very important. And what the student should be able to understand after the chapter is over should be very clear. So that's why we have learning objectives. That is what should they achieve and learning outcome. What have they achieved? So there is direction not only for the educator in this, but also for your students. Because the direction is not unidirectional that means it has to be multi-dimensional because the reason being that it is not your job just to deliver the lecture and come out that's not our job right our job is not just to deliver the lecture and come after 40 minutes or one hour our job is basically to make the majority of the class understand what we are trying to say of course you know, 100% result is a challenge. It's not impossible, but it's a challenge. But at least we can concentrate on the majority. If out of 40, only five people are able to understand your classes, that means our strategy is not effective. And therefore, we have to devise better strategies so that our uh, children can understand us better. So a direction and focus for both teachers and students, very, very important. Uh, unless this is planned out, uh, we are not going to achieve anything effective at all. Secondly, use active learning techniques. Uh, we have uh, probably some of us are using very, very, very old techniques which our teachers used to use. And you know, the times have changed so rapidly with the coming of artificial intelligence and uh, coding and uh, you know, we are teaching through digital medium. Social media has uh, come in a big way. Reference books are available. So much of information overload is there in these uh, era in this era of uh, you know when there is a plethora of resources available it becomes very important to choose active learning techniques it's not something where you are a sage on the stage and you continuously give your lecture no it has to be through participative methods students should be involved in certain activities there should be peer learning there should be collaborative learning there should be experiential learning so group discussions always help because otherwise it becomes very boring, monotonous to just listen to a lecture and then go back home. Half of them may not even have understood what you've said. So student participation. Uh, many educators whom I know personally always discourage students from asking questions. I think that's the biggest thing uh, as an educator you should avoid. Always encourage your questions to ask questions. It shows your confidence. If you are not allowing your students to ask questions, it shows that you have fear of not answering what they are able to uh, ask you. If you are confident about your subject, then you should say, see, this is what I'm explaining. Ask any questions on it. I'm free. So don't feel disturbed or perturbed by that. And some people feel uh, you know, challenged when questions are put by the students or they think that they are deliberately trying to disturb you. So it is important that the teacher keeps his or her cool and answers the questions. Of course, there may be questions that we are not aware of. So we can always tell the student, okay, see, that's a good question. I'm aware 
come across that question. It's a very good question. I will come back to you later. There's no harm in accepting our uh, deficiencies because after all, we are also human beings and we don't know everything, right? So uh, let's encourage questioning in the class. Let's encourage discussions and let's encourage experimenting. Uh, let's encourage role play. We, all this, which art integration is uh, specifying, the different ways in which we can introduce our lessons, allow the child, uh, you know, freedom. You know, some teachers are very particular that there should be no discussion, there should be pin drop silence. Of course, it's easier for the teacher to teach when there is pin drop silence. But what happens to the participation? Allow the children in a controlled way, of course, to participate in your classes so that it becomes more meaningful and result oriented. So it this only will provide deeper understanding into what you are trying to teach them. Then uh, always make it relevant for the students because unless the information is relevant, students will take a backseat. Oh, where is this going to be used in real life? So when we are teaching something and you have an example that this is used by this country or this place or by this person, it always helps. So real life examples, it could be personal stories from your own life that, okay, when I was in college, you know, this happened and now this is happening. So, and uh, relevance of things has to be seen. Otherwise, you are talking about, uh, let's say, match congruency and similarity and you don't know what, where is it used. The children are obviously going to take a backseat in the learning because you're not able to connect it to real life. So that is why we uh, talk about gamification of learning. So gamification is very important. Bringing about the practical aspects uh, of what you are teaching to the students is very important. Then the student will find relevance in what they are learning and you will find happiness in teaching something relevant to the students. So it works both ways. Then of course, uh, we are all aware that we are teaching a group of 40 students and the levels are all different. You will have very, very brilliant students who are uh, hyperactive students uh, who are answering the question. There will be some students who will not open their mouth at all. And there will be students who are not understanding. There will be children with special needs. There will be children uh, who require extra help by special educator or counselors. So what we need to do is that when we are teaching in the class, let's focus on the average students so that all are taken care of. It's not that we are bringing in the extremely tough questions or bringing in, you know, uh, high intellectual discussions in the classroom that, you know, those who are not up to the mark are not able to participate at all. They feel lost. Then they will not be interested in your classes. So what is important is that uh, we use a variety of teaching methods because we have all kinds of learners, auditory learners, visual learners, kinesthetic learners. So I think it's important that we involve, if not all, at least a few uh, of the techniques so that all the students can be uh, involved in the whole process of learning and the students are able to understand what you're talking about. So provide them notes, give them videos, uh, you know, uh, involve them in class discussion, let there be role plays, let there be some drama in the class, let, their, let them express through different forms of music or painting or clay modeling or, you know, paper mache or mime, whatever art form, so that the meanings become more clear and our learning objectives is achieved. Ultimately, our aim is that every child should learn uh, what our objective is and therefore, our assignments, our projects all should be meaningful and should be in that direction. Ultimately, our aim is to create happy classrooms, not sad. So if the, you are going in a class and all are very sad, then that means there is an issue. We have to change the atmosphere. Oh, sir has come, ma'am has come. So they're excited to learn from you. That means you have built your rapport with the students. See, what is important is that, you know, how you interact with the students. What I've seen through my personal experience is that how you interact, how you build your rapport is very important because content is more or less same with every teacher, okay? You are a postgraduate, you are a graduate and there will be online material, reference material, somebody is, uh, uh, you know, having tutor. So the material is available uh, with everyone. But how you present it, and how you are uh, building a rapport with the students is what makes a difference between the teachers. So nobody remembers the teachers once they pass out for the teaching that they did actually. It's how you made them feel. So did you insult them or you know you helped them in their uh, tough times? You said that okay, you could have done better when uh, things were wearing or did you shout at them, made them feel low or you abused them or physically hit them? which are obviously not allowed. That is one thing. But still, 
there are some educators who resort to this because of their own weaknesses. We read in the newspaper that such and such child, this was this happened and all. And then what happens since they are minors, it becomes a little more serious. As adults, I think we need to control our emotions and because, you know, controlling a class of 40, 50 students is definitely not easy. Sometimes we are enthusiastic, we go prepared and we lose our temper, yes. But I think that's what teaching is all about. I think the number one quality of a teacher should be patience and obviously learning from experience. So as we are experienced, we find that we know how to deal with our students. We are more calm. We are more gentle. We are more empathetic rather than when we were young, you know, hot blood. And then you want to make sure that there is absolute silence in the class. And then you ask some students to go out of the class. Then you send SMS to the parents. You write diary notes. A lot of action takes place when you are young. But as you are in this field, you realize that there are lots of other techniques by which we can connect with the heart of the child and we can connect with the mind of the child so that the child will automatically listen to you. So you find that there are so many teachers in our schools who are just, uh, you know, going to the class and there is absolute silence and children appreciate what they are saying. There is so much respect for that teacher. Why? Because that teacher has become a guru. A teacher is someone who just teaches. A guru is someone who imparts knowledge and, you know, the holistic development of the child is seen. So uh, I think from teacher, you know, which is a very general uh, word for anybody who imparts education it has to be we have to go to that system of guru where uh, it's about uh, a holistic development of the child so when we start becoming that i think our classrooms are going to be more interesting and we also get a sense of uh, satisfaction in our teaching vocation right so uh, that's a very very effective strategy to support our students because it's always our weak students who will remember us so many times when we go to the market, it will be some mischievous students who you must have punished, who will come and who come and say, good morning, ma'am, uh, good evening, sir, and all that. And the very intelligent fellow may be, you know, crack the IIT and he may be busy with his work and he may ignore you. I'm saying, I'm just giving an example. It may not be the case in all times. There will be very good students who will do and wish you and give respect to you. But majority of the cases we have seen that it's the naughty ones who love you more because you made them, uh, you know, uh, special. You didn't, uh, you uh, cared for them and you made sure that they didn't go in the wrong way and you were a friend to them. You were a facilitator and a mentor for them. So they are going to thank you for that uh, instead of saying that, okay, these fellows, I can't do anything and uh, let them go to hell. I am not bothered. I, am, I just want to, you know, take my paycheck. I will come to the school and go back. So if we have that attitude, then obviously all those children will identify children can identify each and every <laughs> teacher of the school because they are able to connect with the heart of the teacher. So how much ever I have seen uh, sometimes when we scream, we scold, they know that, you know, sir or ma'am is just screaming just like that. Within the heart, he or she is okay. Uh, we have observed in that. And then the next day they will say, hello, sir, how are you? you know, I must have scolded him very badly the previous day but they know that i meant i didn't mean it personally it was for an act which they did and it's over and so our attitude we shouldn't keep grudges against students uh, so all this goes a long way in uh, becoming a better teacher then of course incorporate talk technology after the covid times especially if you are ignorant about technology then your children are definitely going to laugh at you oh ma'am or sir they don't know this much Okay, they are discussing about uh, Chat GPT and uh, Google Bard and, uh, you know, so many apps that they must have discovered in making certain things. And, uh, you know, you must have some idea about all this. If you don't know, then at least find out what it is. It's important because there is so many resources available through multimedia, uh, educational apps are there. So technology will definitely, they're interested. Our students are 10 times smarter than us when it comes to technology, okay? So when I get I get stuck in something, uh, although I know a little bit, but I know that, you know, my daughter will be able to find out what's the problem in that faster because, you know, their mind works in that way. And we are very good with text, So, but they are good with technology, right? So I will go to my daughter and say, okay, see, uh, Michelle, this is what the problem is. Uh, can you make it better? Or can you tell me how we can do it in this way? And, you know, she will just do something and it will become, so it becomes uh, very, it's, it's, it's for any student, I guess. So if you go to any student, they are very well versed with uh, technology. So, and I think as educators, 
uh, of this century of uh, where we are introducing NCF and NEP and the you know the so many assessment and uh, frameworks have come. I think it's important that we are going to increase student engagement through uh, information and interactive learning opportunity should be given through multimedia and online resources. It's not only the school teaching and say, okay, you were absent today, now I'm not going to repeat. Uh, why not? We, we have so many online resources available where uh, you can probably record your lectures or you have, uh, you know, those um, comic strips are available for many uh, subjects. You have animated videos explaining a concept. So all that be, can be given, uh, you can give access to all those to your students, right? And uh, use a lot of testing because this is one common thing that I have observed in uh, my classes that many parents come and tell that, sir, he has been practicing uh, and then, but and, uh, when the exam comes, he is not able to do score marks. So what is happening is that testing is not done. So you are teaching for two months and then you are giving a test, you realize that the child was probably pretending that to understand or the child knows a little bit, but then making mistakes. So how are we going to know? That is through the tests, formative tests. So we need to uh, find out how our children are progressing with the help of these formative tests. Regularly give them tests, uh, give quiz assignments in the class so that, you know, the, the children are also happy with quiz. Whenever I go for substitution, they will all get ex excited. So can we have a quiz today? And of course, there will be a lot of noise and also, uh, but they are very excited about quiz. Uh, we can initiate classroom discussion. They are very happy to give their opinion on certain things. Uh, you are starting topics and then you are asking their opinion. Very, very important. So uh, providing feedback to the student is very important. That, okay, see, this is what you are doing. This is what you think you are, but this is the reality. So when we have a test next month, plan for it. So when we give a feedback to the student, to the parent and uh, and we ourselves know how the student is faring in these small, small tests. So we get an idea about what has to be done further. Oh, and the student also knows, okay, see, I've been pretending to know, but actually when the test is coming, I'm not able to do, or I'm too slow to complete it in the stipulated time. So these are issues uh, which can be rectified through the formative assessments. Provide feedback, constructive feedback. This is important. It's not always about uh, negative feedback. Your child is not studying incomplete work, you know, untidy work, uh, make diagrams neatly. We always give this, no? As teachers, we always give this. But how many of us give constructive feedbacks? In fact, I was very happy when our school introduced the school diary, there was a column, positive feedback. And positive feedback is some you see something very good in the child, write down, okay, today, uh, so and so, Aditya did a very good work in the maths class or in the science class, or he made a very good project. And the child feels happy because, the, you know, that, that's a record. Just like for negative comments, the child will always hide their school diaries. Positive, he will leave freely and anybody can see his diary. There are positive feedbacks. How many of us use positive feedback? So many I see in the lower classes, it's very common. No? They give that. I, uh, today, ma'am has given star <laughs> on the hand and they are so happy to show their father and mother. Today, I got a star. They will not rub it. Or, you know, ma'am puts a sticker on the notebooks. Uh, so it happens in the primary, I'm aware of that. But as they grow, why not? So you think that they are bigger students, they don't require. But secretly, you know, they feel so happy. So when you give a good or very good or excellent, keep it up, you know, and uh, you uh, make a smiley, all this, you know, activates their brains into performing better. Because that's an incentive that you are providing. You are making them feel that you appreciate what they did and there is hope for improvement. So it's very important to uh, encourage our students in terms of uh, giving feedback, positive feedbacks, constructive feedback, so that they can perform better and better in the upcoming tests. So a positive learning environment has to be cultivated in the class. So environment in the class has to be conducive. The, the students, if they fear you, you know, they, in olden times, they, the teacher used to come with a stick. Uh, they used to take a branch you know, shave off the leaves very <laughs> patiently and uh, probably put some oil and bring it in the class. And anything happens, give them a whack. I'm talking about 30, 40 years back. You know, my parents used to say that in uh, when they used to go to school, <laughs> they used to get whacked. Even when we were small, um, uh, we used to hear that, you know, in many schools, in our schools, we, we didn't have this culture. But, you know, the, I have heard from my friends in the locality that 
they used to get slapped by their teachers and all. You know, that's we are talking about 20, 25 years back. Of course, things have changed now and for the better, of course. There is no corporal punishment and so on. And I'm not only really talking about the, the physical punishment, but are we cultivating a positive learning environment in our class? Do the children feel, okay, today is uh, science class, today is English class. Are they excited? Are they positive about Are they comfortable in asking you questions? Are you, are, uh, do they have a positive relationship between you? So that's important. So cultivate a positive environment. Environment is very important. Our classes environment should not be of fear. It should not be of, you know, that there's um, of... Um, uh, where the children are suppressed, where they cannot express. It has to be free, right? The freedom has to be there. Collaboration has to be there between the students, between make small groups. That is why, you know, the CBSE is doing a very good thing by allotting projects in multidisciplinary approach in the smaller classes. And for the bigger classes, they are having this EBSB projects and so on. So that gives them time to collaborate between themselves. Collaboration is very, very important because we live in a society where we have to collaborate. We cannot live in isolation. However good we are, we cannot live in isolation. We have to cooperate and collaborate with others. So we need to share our best practices with others. Uh, in many schools, this is lacking. So ABC is a good teacher, but XYZ is not. So ABC doesn't share to XYZ. That's a problem. So the school should strive that every good teacher should share something to the not so experienced or the young teachers. So sharing of good practices, what happens in their classroom, why are their classes so effective, share with your colleagues. So it's important and this gives them a time, okay, what am I doing wrong? This is what this teacher is doing right and that is why her results are better. That is why the children respect her more. So we need to bring change in ourselves. And therefore, what happens? We are providing ourselves an opportunity for self-assessment. So we are going to devise better instructional strategies. So there is nothing wrong in seeking advice from your juniors or seniors, because unless we learn from teachers who are better than us, we will stay in that frog's well, okay, thinking that, oh, I am almighty powerful. And ultimately, what is you are jumping in the well, nothing, you don't know what is happening in the outside world. So that is why uh, we stay at one place and, you know, we don't get scope uh, of growing from that skip. And then you retire and then you realize what have I done for 35 years in a school. Uh, children don't even remember you. Okay. So who taught you English in class 9 and 10? I have seen that uh, some people will scratch their head. They don't even name, know their names. So who taught you maths in 11, 12? And, or who taught you maths in 9, 10? So if they remember the name of the teachers, you may think it's easy. Or how can I remember 40 students' name every year I'm teaching? But sometimes I have seen that students also scratch their heads because that teacher has not made an impact at all. Or who, who They will ask their friends, who taught us maths in 9, 10? They will scratch their heads. Or who taught us in class 5 and 6? You see, so and there were impactful teachers. Uh, I remember my class 3, 4, 5 teacher because, you know, she was so loving and kind. And, uh, you know, so that becomes, so uh, we still, all our batchmates have so much regard for her. Her name is, you know, if she is listening to this, I, or I'll send this recording to her, she'll be very happy. Uh, Deepa Pantman. And Deepa ma'am was something like a mother, more than a mother. Because when we used to go, uh, I used to feel that I was her favorite student. And throughout the uh, class three, four, five, three years, she taught all our uh, the, that particular batch. We felt that uh, I felt that I was her favorite student. Later on in life, we realized that she used to give that same love to all the students, and all the students were thinking the same thing that I am the favorite of my teacher. You see the beauty of her love. So this is very very important that you know you love the students so much that everybody is feeling that I oh, am I am my teacher's favorite. And uh, I'll send this video to her. She'll be very happy because I think I have never ex expressed this, uh, that uh, part of, the, of course, I'm in touch with her and uh, she is exceptionally, you know, emotional when it comes to her students. So some teachers make a difference in your lives. So I think we need to be teachers like that. We need to be teachers who connect with our students, who are able to, you know, whether you have taught in KG also. I have seen even some KG teachers. Ma'am, sir, you know, uh, I remember we you taught us this in KG. I am surprised because they are very small. They are hardly four years, but they remember certain instances. Ma'am, you helped me in this. 
So, you know, I have seen with my wife who was a primary teacher, there are so many students uh, connected to her on Facebook and she has taught them in probably KG or one, very, very small. And now they're in college, working, married and all. But the kind of relationship that she has with the students, it's amazing. So that's what it is. So if you think that you are a primary teacher or, you know, you are from middle school, uh, only students respect high school, that's all fallacy, it's false. You can connect with your students in all classes and you make a difference. And that's what gives you happiness. Oh, see that they have got good reviews. You know, it's like uh, getting those stars. We are getting back those stars, which we gave to our students. They will say, sir, is very good, ma'am, is very good. And we feel so happy about it. And they'll share some incident uh, about uh, the class, which you may have forgotten. Simple, simple acts of kindness, which you must have done, or simple things which you must have uh, said to them. So that makes a difference. Of course, then using visual aids. Visual aids is very, very important. Uh, when we are using visual aids, uh, our classes become uh, more interesting. Otherwise, you know, lecture method. Suppose I'm taking this session without any uh, visual aid, no PPT, and I'm just talking to you. Half of the, you will be running away. Okay. Today, hundreds of you are listening to this because of the fact that I am supporting whatever I am saying through my experience. That is one thing. And also uh, through this multimedia which I have used. It's not a, a lecture method where I am just speaking. So there is a, a PPT that is prepared. Same way when we go to our classes, we need to make use of teaching aids. When we do our B ed, we prepare all sort of uh, things and present. And then what happens as we become senior, then we feel like, hey, no need. We'll just go. So our effectiveness reduces as a teacher. So make use of the blackboard, make use of teaching aids, take models to the class. Nowadays, many schools are having smart boards, use that. Then you have PowerPoint presentations or you have videos, all that can be played in the classroom and also send to your class WhatsApp groups if you have. So visuals will obviously help the students to understand even difficult concepts because there are lots of visual learners and information becomes more meaningful and uh, the student is able to uh, understand those concepts much better. Continuous professional development is very, very important because I have seen, uh, we will do this when we retire. I have heard a very, very common statement in many teachers. I think that's something which is very wrong and we have to teach. As teachers, I think the growth has to start the day we join. It's not about 10 years down the line or 20 years down the line. The growth is continuous. It's not about the post, remember. Okay, you may be a PRT or a TGT or PGT and you may remain there for 30 years or 35 years. I'm not talking about you becoming vice principal and principal. These are all posts. I'm not talking about posts, but I'm talking about self-development. As a teacher, you should always strive to become better. You should not be a teacher uh, whom the students found you 10 years back and now also you are same. Uh, then that means you have not grown. So you need to attend the workshops, you need to update yourself, you need to learn, you need to read, you need to interact, you need to collaborate, and you need to seek opportunities to become better, to improve your teaching skills. Like today you are attending this session to become better teachers. So I'm sure that if you are with like-minded people who want to become better, then you become better. If you are with people who are always negative, cribbing about situation, then you also become the, you know, the black sheep in the institution. So it is important that we always remain positive and you become mentors of other people and or if you uh, find a mentor for yourself. So there always has to be a learning process. It's important. Otherwise, if you are stagnant, then you are finished. As a teacher, let me tell you that you are finished. It As I told you, it's not about the post, but it's about your uh, popularity or it's your uh, charisma in the class. Uh, people will stop respecting you. Students will obviously find the difference. Uh, you are going sleepy or you are, go you are having negativities in your mind or you are having issues and then you go to the classroom and teach with all those heavy uh, things in your mind. Obviously, your lectures are not going to be perfect. So how are we going to do that? By becoming professionally strong. Our focus should and objective should be strong. So we need to improve ourselves continuously by finding people who are better than us. That's important. There are always people better than us. Nobody can say I'm the best. Nobody is better than us. So we find people and then we observe how is that person doing better than us. And we try to emulate so that we can become uh, equal to them, if not better. So this is how we learn. We, have, we should have different uh, mentors in our lives and continuously we should uh, grow in our teaching profession. So uh, 
that's how we grow professionally. Encourage student collaboration because, you know, nowadays I find that there are many students who are so self-centered, they don't share notes or their parents sometimes say surprisingly that, you know, don't help out because you will be wasting time. Teaching other students is actually the best way to learn yourself. So many concepts they get to learn. Uh, I went for substitution in one of the classes. I saw one student and five, six people were gathered around him and he was teaching biology to them. And I was really surprised that that student made such an impact uh, with his friends instead of gossiping and doing nonsense or playing games or something like that. These six students were sitting and listening to him so attentively that I could not believe that this was happening in the class. So uh, when I asked what is it, so, so then the student said, sir, he explains very well. And because of that, he that boy who's explaining, he's not afraid that the others will become better than him. He actually became the biology topper of that class uh, last year. So this is how peer teaching helps. So it is not a wastage of time. Parents should not think that, you know, my child is helping someone. So, you know, my child's time is getting wasted. So actually this collaboration and helping others will act, make you better. So always encourage your children to collaborate with others, you know, and help others. Uh, this will help in uh, increasing their communication skills, problem solving skills. You know, they, they will, um, when they are working in group, there will be problems. And when you solve those problems, you're preparing them for life. Communication skills, how to communicate. It's not, you know, normal talking. Uh, where are you going? I am going to the house, you know, normal that. When you are discussing a project, there is meaningful communication happening. And like in work culture, when we are having meetings and conferences or seminars, we have meaningful discussions. So children also get used to having meaningful discussion. And I think we, uh, if we encourage this, uh, it's a very, very good thing that's going to happen. Another uh, very, very important technique for effective teaching is storytelling. Who doesn't like stories? As kids, uh, we always used to listen to stories. I, as a kid, used to listen to stories. I have seen my daughter listen to stories for uh, 10 to 12 years of her childhood. Every day, she wanted a story, right? And similarly, with our kids, when they are small, you know, they are so excited to listen to stories. And as they grow, it is not that, you know, the they don't like stories. It is obviously that uh, as adults, we stop telling them stories because we feel that they have grown up and they will not be interested. But see, so many, we still watch movies, don't we? And what are movies? They are stories. And we still love to listen to people, you know, uh, sharing their experience or anecdotes when they have visited certain places and they share. These are all stories. So why not share stories in the classroom? And that makes engage, uh, the learning engaging and memorable. So our anecdotes are very important. Whenever we are speaking something, if we bring in live examples, it changes the dimension totally. Uh, for example, in this session, if I am trying to bring in examples which really happened in my life or what I have experienced in my classroom, that changes the dynamics of the whole session. Similarly, when we are in our classroom, we should always relate. Okay, this I had gone to this place. I had... And this is what I saw, or this is what I happened, this is important. So when we are emotionally able to connect to that child through that subject matter that we are teaching, I think we become better teachers. So when we are uh, talking about, uh, you know, uh, for example, if there is a rain and you are talking about a poem which describes rain. So you can say, okay, when we were small, uh, you know, we used to make those paper boats. It's not there in the chapter, but we can always bring. We used to make that paper boats and then, you know, uh, put it in the water and it used to go. So you can narrate that. Or there used to be lots of kids who used to play in the rain. They used to splash water. So what are the things associated with the rain? We are, we are telling them what happened in our childhood or what we have observed or seen. And then what happened? They also start sharing. Okay, this is what happens. Or these are the things which they have experienced. So it becomes a discussion. And then you are able to connect with the topic of rain in our classrooms. So similarly for any, whether you are math teacher, science teacher, I think the story, storytelling is very important. It is uh, uh, becoming one of the most important techniques of taking a class. Whenever we are taking a class, when we start the introdu introduction of the class, we start with stories. And, uh, you know, even in maths, which uh, we can introduce so many stories. Storytelling is important because, you know, the emphasis on the 
mathematicians probably are not given. So you are talking something like Heron's formula. You can talk about who is Heron and where is he from? What is his story? Okay. Uh, the other day when we were, I was uh, uh, teaching my class coordinate geometry, I uh, talked to them about René Descartes, who was a French mathematician, and how he discovered the coordinate system by when he was lying down, he saw the uh, the spider's web, which inspired him to make the uh, x-axis and y-axis and all the coordinate system. And that is why the coordinate system is also known as the Cartesian system. So many students didn't know about all this, uh, that Cartesian system is because of the uh, French mathematician René Descartes. And, you know, he got this idea of making the coordinate system from a spider's web. So these are things which we can introduce. These are stories. And then when you get into the topic or when you talk about probability, uh, you know, you have, uh, this was discovered by gamblers, actually. So I don't want to get into too much of maths. I'll be planning a different session for mathematics teachers. Gamification of maths uh, coming soon. Uh, today's session is a general session. So, you know, the examples I, I'm talking about may not be relevant to all. But I'm just saying that in every subject, we can bring in the story element. And story excites not only you, but our listeners as well. Because we don't know uh, what is the end, right? Because when we are talking about a particular subject, some people must have read that. But when you're sharing your personal stories, nobody knows that. So they're excited. What happened to sir or ma'am? And what happened in the end? They are interested. So that, this is how we catch the attention of our students. And uh, very, very important is that as educators, we need to be enthusiastic. However difficult our day was at home or however uh, depressed we are or whatever physical illness we may be having but when we are in the class i saw one video i i i'm sure you must have it was a whatsapp video forwarded where a japanese teacher you know so a lot of problems at home and just before uh, it was captured on a video camera and just before the class he's you know patting his uh, cheeks and he puts on a smile and then he enters the class and inside he is so sad and this is what happens when you are entering the class. Hello, students, how are you? Today we are going to do trigonometry. And, you know, trigonometry is the most important topic uh, in mathematics. And, uh, you know, a trigonometry comes from three words, trigonometron, and then you start explaining. And you are excited about it. And then you say, you know, as a student, I was so interested in trigonometry. This is one way of introducing, making them excited. The other way, uh, students, today we are going to start with trigonometry. And this is one of the most difficult topics that you will find in class 10. And, you know, already you have declared it's a difficult topic. And, you know, this identities are very tough. Uh, this will come for four marks. And I have seen in the past years that uh, most of the students go wrong in it. So already you have created a negative impression that this is the toughest thing. Most of the students go wrong in it. You know, so you have created that. And the first approach that I did, was of excitement. This is the most interesting thing when you're trying to explain them what trigonometry is. You can bring in a lot of real life examples, which again, I don't want to bring in here. I will take a separate session for the math teachers. Uh, so like that. So you can bring in real life examples, which can not only in math, I'm talking about every subject, you create that enthusiasm. People should see, oh, that person is an enthusiastic English teacher or he or she is passionate about that subject. Nobody should feel that you are forced into that profession. Ooh, yeah, they are just coming there, going home. That's all. Nothing else. No rapport with the colleagues, no rapport with students. I'm sure you will find so many of our colleagues in that uh, bracket. And there will be so many of them enthusiastic, wishing you good morning. How are you? How was the day? They'll be giving you some advice on how to become better. Or, you know, they will be always supporting you. Uh, Ma'am, what happened? Or sir, what happened? Can I help you in this, you know? And so that is the difference between a good educator and a, and an average educator. Nobody is bad, but you can be average or you can be good. But at the same time, you can become better and better. The average can become good, good can become excellent, right? So as I told you, the teacher has to become a guru. That is our ultimate aim. The day you become a guru, then your followers will be happy. And, you know, whatever you say becomes the truth. So... That's how we should aspire for our energy and in how we engage with our students. What is our energy level is very paramount for any student and it changes the dynamics of the classroom. So if you are going and teaching with a sleepy tone, obviously they'll also be sleepy. You are excited uh, and then children also get excited. Sometimes it happens in the reverse way also. Sometimes, you know, we are sleepy. Students are so excited about the topic. Sir, today we are going to do coordinate geometry. And seeing their enthusiasm, your body language also changes. Yes, 
Today we are going to do coordinate geometry. This is what it is all about. It's a very interesting topic. Never say that we are going to do a tough topic or boring topic or, uh, you know, frighten them out of their, <laughs> uh, that uh, what the mindset should not change. Always we should encourage them that it is okay. We will be able to do better. Sometimes it requires a lot of practice. You can say motivating words about the same so that uh, it's not that. So I hope I was able to cover a uh, few uh, points where which would have helped you in becoming a better teacher. And I am sure that by implementing these strategies, if not all, at least some, uh, we will be able to create good teaching environment in our classrooms which supports student learning, engagement and achievement. Ultimately, I think... Uh, parents and teachers are the only two people in the whole world who wants the good of their students, right? So there will be all the others who may think that, okay, I should succeed, I should become better. They're so competitive. You go to an, an office, you go to college, there will always be competitive. Oh, I want to become first. But your teachers will always be people, let's say your parents, they will always want you to succeed in life. So I think as... Good teachers, as excellent teachers, we need to aspire to become gurus. We need to change our teaching strategies for the better. And if you are feeling low or discouraged by anything, please remember that these small moments that you give of happiness that you give to your students, how you make them feel, the support that you uh, give to them, will come back a hundredfold to you in your lives. That's, that's a promise that I can give you. You will not realize that now, but after putting in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years or 40 years of service, you will realize that the sense of satisfaction that you have made a difference in so many lives will always be a blessing for you and you will be rewarded abundantly. And not only by the prayers of your students, but also the goodwill of all the stakeholders who were involved with you when you were an educator. So on this note, I want to wish you all the best. Keep updating yourself, um, be energetic, be dynamic and continue to take fantastic classes and i'm sure our students are going to do extremely well in life thank you and all the best